Good evening, you're listening to BBC Radio Wales. But just after 6.30, it's time for Ion Wales, which this week hears from three families caught up in the early stages of the contaminated blood scandal. It's a, an unfortunate fact that the incubation period for AIDS is extremely long. We know that a certain proportion had been previously exposed to the virus. We will follow them uh, up closely. The late Professor Arthur Bloom was a leading expert in blood disorders. In the 1980s, he was the go-to guy for his colleagues, and even more than that, to his patients. A lot of the haemophiliacs thought that Professor Bloom was a god. If he said he could take your head off and sew it back on, and he'd cope with the bleeding, they'd let him do it. So if he said it was all right, it was all right. No questioning at all? Yeah, no questioning. But some of those he treated or the loved ones they left behind, have been handpicked by a judge to tell a public inquiry why they now believe the professor has to answer from beyond the grave for suffering and deaths. He made some very, very bad choices and some unwise decisions. The prof I knew came across as a very kind, caring person, but in hindsight, he made some very, very bad choices. Was he experimenting on live patients? For all practical purposes, yes. Yes, he was. The Infected Blood Inquiry is this week holding hearings here in Cardiff, where a haemophilia centre is named after Professor Bloom. But the late medic's reputation is on the line after documents and medical records tracked down since his death show he knew there were risks for his patients, but said nothing about them. That paper trail was begun by two of his patients, brothers Hayden and Gareth Lewis, both infected with HIV and hepatitis C by the contaminated blood products supposed to help them. The work of the Lewis brothers was absolutely essential to the inquiry which is now taking place. They had, at a very early stage, uncovered a mass of material which pointed the finger at Arthur Bloom. Unfortunately, they were not listened to. I'm Stephen Fairclough and this week Ion Wales hears how Welsh haemophilia victims of this scandal trace their suffering to the work of one eminent man who was trusted to do no harm. My name's Bev Tamalti. I'm the sister of Hayden and Gareth Lewis, who were both infected with uh, HIV and Hep C, and also non-variant CJD via their um, Factor Eight blood products. One of my earliest memories, I would say, would be of sitting in a hospital waiting for the boys to be seen, or of them in a hospital bed on bed rest. So it was all pretty constant. The haemophilia was very much a part of life. Oh, 100%, yeah. It was one or, or the other of them in some sort of trouble with a bleed. Hayden and Gareth had haemophilia, a genetic disorder in which cuts and bruises continue to bleed. Bev Tumulty credits the many visits with her brothers to the Heath Hospital in Cardiff for sparking her later career choice in nursing. And it was where and when she came to know the man whose expertise drove her brother's care. I knew um, Professor Bloom from a, a very young age. Yeah, he was, you know, he was Prof Bloom. He was very friendly, very amiable. He was kind. Arthur Bloom was one of the UK's leading authorities in haematology or blood diseases, first based in Oxford and then in Cardiff. When he was treating the Lewis brothers and other haemophiliacs in the early 1980s, he had a transformatory new treatment for them, a blood clotting product called Factor 8. It was considered the wonder drug. This was going to sort you out, this would help stop subsequent joint damage and things because the bleeds would be resolved quicker. You wouldn't need these extended periods in hospital, having bed rest and the cryoprecipitate treatment at the time, which took ages. It, it was absolutely considered the wonder drug for haemophiliacs and it will solve all your problems. And, and that's what we all thought. Haemophilia runs in families and males are much more likely to need treatment. Professor Bloom called patients like Hayden and Gareth Lewis his boys. And in 1982 little Colin Smith came along. We met Professor Bloom literally when Colin was diagnosed with haemophilia. He was about four months old. Janet Smith and her husband, also called Colin, couldn't believe their luck when they learned who would be treating the youngest of their four sons for his haemophilia. He was an amazing man. 
at that time. He gave us a lot of support, told us he was in the best possible hands. We came away from that meeting thinking, oh wow, this is fantastic. Always spoke to us, always called all the haemophiliacs his boys. It was just amazing. We just came away from there thinking, <coughs> God, we've struck lucky, you know, that he's, he's got such a wonderful man looking after him. I think it coincided with the fact that Factor 8 has just come into use and uh, it was a life changer. Along with support from Prof Bloom, taught us home treatment. It was basically a normal life. He hurt himself, give him injection, a couple of hours later he's back on his feet, running around like a lunatic. So it was a life changer, but not in the way we were hoping. As the years passed and little Colin grew from a baby into a young boy, Gareth Lewis became an uncle figure for him. Colin could relate to Gareth. There was a special kind, I think, of um, bond. bond. He'd stay with Colin on the ward. I mean, you know, the one day he sort of said, you go home, I'll stay with Colin. And we went back the following day and his room was littered with takeaways, cans of beer and everything. And my son just woke up and said, that's the best night I've had. And, and he was six. And he was, and Gareth, I call him my brother. He's passed away now, but I miss him so much. What neither family knew then was that they were caught up in a scandal about blood products for haemophiliacs, as well as for general blood transfusions, that would dog the NHS for decades. We now know that the Factor 8 given at this time to the Lewis brothers, Little Colin, and thousands of haemophiliacs across the UK was contaminated. Much of the plasma used to make Factor 8 was pooled from thousands of donors in the US, including drug users and prison inmates who were able to sell their blood even though there were questions over their health. And it only took one infected blood donor to contaminate a batch of Factor 8 destined for hundreds of patients in the UK. Little Colin was among the first of an estimated 1,000 British haemophiliacs to die as a result of HIV infection due to this. Probably his first treatment was with the, uh, the virus of AIDS in it, HIV. We didn't realise that it was imported products and the imported products carried a risk of HIV and Colin was infected with HIV. His sixth birthday it was. He picked up a bug, he couldn't fight it off, and we spent five months, six months at the Heath, mm -hmm. living there, basically, looking for people to look after our other children. And then one day Prof Bloom come up and said, there's nothing more we can do for him. He's uh, not going to make it. At which point we said, well, we're going to take him home. And there was a bit of a row. He said, you can't take him home. But we did, we gave him a date. We picked him out of his bed, brought him home, and this is where he died. Um, 13th of January. Sorry. You wanted him to come home for Christmas? Yes, uh, we wanted him to have uh, one last Christmas with his brothers. I remember the last time I saw Colin, and it was at one of the haemophilia Christmas parties. It was probably Gareth that went over to um, Janet and said, where's Colin? And she was like, oh, he's on the water. The nurses won't let him come to the party. And he, he just went bananas and took Janet over there and they were like, just take that drip down, take that, just, and brought him over to the party. And he literally just sat on Janet's lap. He was very emaciated. It was clear, you know, he was dying. It was horrible. That's, that, and that's my last memory, my enduring memory of him. Um, it was just pitiful, horrible way to die. But his, his death affected Gareth greatly and I think it was then that he just thought right we need to do something about this we need to get some answers and get some um, closure and find out who's to blame for this. By this time both Hayden and Gareth Lewis knew that they too had been infected with HIV and later the deadly liver disease hepatitis C. Their sister Bev Tumulty says each reacted in different ways. They were very different, very different people personality-wise as well. Gareth was definitely more fiery, Hayden more stoic, more measured, more thoughtful in the way he dealt with things. They were very different people. But there came a time 
when they wanted to make a difference and they, they wanted to change things. Yeah, yeah. Hayden, you know, started looking into things and um, when Prof Bloom died, I think it was his wife that found some documents in the home, so in his study, I think, um, and I think she contacted the boys or it might have been the, the centre at the time and said, would you like to come and have a look at these things? You know, of course, they were very interested in certain letters and documents, and um, I think, yeah, it started from there, really. Arthur Bloom died suddenly in 1992. He was 62. It set the Lewis brothers on a paper trail that soon involved their friends, Janet and Colin Smith. After Colin had died, of course, Hayden and Gareth had been digging um, in their own um, medical notes. They phoned us and said, please get Colin's notes. So we got in touch with the Heath, got Colin's notes. So Hayden and Gareth both met us there to make sure there was no problems. I gave them straight to Hayden because I'm not a medical person. I didn't understand them. Hayden knew and Gareth knew what to look for. He took them back to his house. He had them for months. Then we just had a phone call. Gareth and Hayden asked if we were sat down and um, they told us that Colin had been in trials and they were PUPS, which stands for Previously Uninfected Patients. What is clear now is that Professor Bloom had known imported Factor 8 products carried potential risks linking them to HIV and AIDS, then an emerging new disease. Just weeks before little Colin had his first dose of Factor 8, he advised a colleague that it would be circumspect to continue treating children with the old-style but more cumbersome NHS product, Cryptoprecipitate. And it was well known even then that haemophiliacs risked contracting different forms of hepatitis from blood products. Professor Bloom had told colleagues pharmaceutical firms were reducing the infectivity of new forms of Factor VIII with heat treatments and had tested the results on chimpanzees. But he said it was important to have studies on humans as a form of quality control and the best subjects for these studies were described as previously untreated patients or pups. Well, there's another statement uh, somewhere along the lines of it's cheaper than chimpanzees that you'll only test a chimp once you can follow these patients throughout their lives. He's gone from a healthy, happy, ten-month-old baby to a lab rat in one breath. The Lewis brothers were increasingly stunned by what they had discovered. Bev Tumulty told me Hayden was determined to get all the details he could. When they found out where the products had come from and their history, how did they react? How did you as a family react? It was quite shocking. At the time, you'd go to Hayden's and he'd say, oh, have a look at this letter. What do you think of this? And, uh, you know, it, it appears that people knew, you know, a few years before this letter came from Oxford on this date. And um, there were talks about, oh, um, that there might be some issues with the, the factory products. And first of all, you're like, no, that, that can't be true. That can't be so. That wouldn't happen. That couldn't happen. Um, but then as they uncovered more and more material, it absolutely did happen. And, um, you know, the, the evidence is all there. I would imagine people are more careful and more measured now than they used to be. But um, they weren't then and they've been tripped up. And Hayden was very dogged about trying to find this material. Ridiculously dogged, yeah. From his waking breath to his last sleeping breath at night exchanging emails with whoever and phone calls, long phone calls, to try and uncover more documents or to work out the exact timeline. It was quite distressing to see sometimes, especially when he became poorly. You would want to say to him, hey, just, just rest, just relax, just empty your mind, be ill. As well as tracking down previously withheld documents, the brothers threw themselves into helping the haemophilia community in practical terms. They formed a self-help group called the Birch Grove Group, named after the Cardiff pub where they met up. It offered emotional support to the many families in the same situation as them. We were just totally gobsmacked. We, we, we were just in shock. And my husband turned around and said, I never come to the hospital again for treatment. He said, and I'm a murderer. 
I've got something inside me that can kill people. Sue Sparks is speaking publicly about her late husband Les for the first time since Professor Bloom told them that Les had become infected with HIV after being treated with contaminated blood products. It just killed him inside, literally killed him inside. And what made it difficult, we had two young children. And our whole life changed that day. 15th of September, 1985, our life changed forever. Sue says her husband was horrified by needles and would stubbornly stay at home and suffer with a bleed rather than go to hospital for help. The fact that I made him go up there a lot of the times, he did turn around and say that if I'd stuck to my guns, I wouldn't be in this situation because I wouldn't have been going to the hospital and having treatment. So I wouldn't have had this thing inside me. That must have been really difficult to hear. I've never got over it, to be honest with you. It's something that I don't think I'll ever get over. I always felt guilty, the fact that I made him go to the hospital. But you were doing it because you thought it was the right thing? Oh, yeah, definitely. It, it was the right thing at the time. No one knew about any of these different things that were going around in the blood. Only the powers to be knew about them. And they were still giving it to all the boys and that. And the advice you were given from the hospital, from the doctors, from the professor, was that this is the right thing, this is going to help? Oh, yes, definitely. My husband, at the time... He thought, and not just my husband, a lot of the haemophiliacs thought back in the day that Professor Bloom was a little god. And if he said he could take your head off and sew it back on and he'd cope with the bleeding, they'd let him do it. So if he said it was all right, it was all right. No questioning at all? Yeah, no questioning. Les died in the same year as little Colin Smith, as well as HIV he also had hepatitis C. It was then that Sue learned about the Birchgrove group. There, she met Janet Smith. Everyone in that room understood what you were going through. Myself, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that group. In 2006, Gareth and Hayden were instrumental in setting up Tainted Blood, a UK-wide campaign group. And the following year, Hayden's research was used in the BBC Newsnight programme telling Colin Smith's story. Dead at the age of seven, were politicians complicit in this and the deaths of 2,000 other haemophiliacs? Hayden made a number of media appearances in the last years of his life. It was evident to me that I, I met the criteria of being a previously untreated patient with commercial products. There's no excuse for not informing a patient of a risk. There's no excuse for not asking for their consent. Um, it's deplorable and criminal, I would even suggest. Almost 3,000 people, mostly haemophiliacs, have died after being infected with HIV and hepatitis C through blood treatments. There have been two previous inquiries into the scandal, but both have been dismissed by campaigners as a whitewash. The current judge-led public inquiry is described as the biggest in UK history, with some 130 staff looking through more than 10 million pages of paper and electronic records. It started in London in September last year and has already held sessions in Leeds and Belfast. Its remit is to establish why patients were infected and if there was a cover-up. Bev Tumulty told me what she hoped for. It's time now to find the proper answers to ascertain the truth of what went on, what exactly happened, who is to blame, if anyone's to blame. Or was it a series of very unfortunate events that nobody is accountable for, which I find hard to believe, and to get some closure and some peace of mind for, for everybody. The contaminated blood inquiry has already heard more than 25,000 people who received blood products or blood transfusions before 1991 could have been infected. It shows you the, the sheer numbers of people that were infected and affected 
by this. Robert Winston said it was the, the biggest medical disaster in the history of the NHS. You know, what does that tell you? But I think over the years, no one has quite believed it until now. But the inquiry has come too late for Gareth and Hayden. They died within months of each other in 2010. Hayden's liver cancer returned and Gareth collapsed and died within hours while on holiday in Spain with Bev. Both men were in their 50s. Two years ago, the campaign group they helped found, Tainted Blood, joined others in legal action against the UK's Department of Health. Among the hundreds of people in the case are Bev Tumulty, Sue Sparks and Janet and Colin Smith. Their lawyer is Des Collins. The work of the Lewis brothers was absolutely essential to the inquiry which is now taking place. It's absolutely essential in the sense that they had, at a very early stage, uncovered a mass of material which pointed the finger at Arthur Bloom. Unfortunately, they were not listened to. One of the first sets of documents which were produced to us when we started working on this two and a half years ago were the results of the Lewis Brothers inquiries, the efforts they'd made, and it's those documents which came before us which caused us to believe that this was a case which had to be answered. Was he experimenting on live patients? For all practical purposes, yes. Yes, he was. He was using the material available to him to test on their son in circumstances where he had no authority to do that, and that amounts to an assault. If Professor Bloom were alive today, what sanctions could he be facing? In all probability, given that uh, young Colin died, it would be a manslaughter. No doubt about that. Culpable homicide. Uh, the, he knew what he was doing. It wasn't a mistake. His reputation cannot remain intact after we now know what he did. Now, some people may say, well, he did his best, but... If that was his best, it fell so far short of what the appropriate standards are and were that it is wrong that his reputation should remain intact. This isn't trying to ruin the man's reputation after he's dead when he can't defend himself. This is a reputation which he ruined himself and went to the grave never thinking it would be uncovered. Sue Sparks says in the final year or two of the professor's life, she remembers a change in his behaviour to patients and their families. Where Prof Bloom used to be hands-on and all the patients were his children and he'd watch them grow up and live their life with them, basically. He'd gone to weddings and christenings and all sorts over the years and that. Towards the end, we had noticed he'd sort of backed off a bit where before you'd see him coming along the corridor and and that going round here and everything, saying hello to everyone and how are you and all this. He backed right off towards the last maybe year or so. He knew what was going on. He's got to have known. Got to have. I don't think I don't think I could, and I don't think anybody else could forgive him. Cardiff and Vale University Health Board told this programme it is cooperating fully with the contaminated blood inquiry and will support the independent review in whichever way it can. A spokesman said, We cannot comment on historical allegations at this stage and will await the findings of the inquiry. As with many other parts of the health service across the UK, we are seeking to understand the implications this has had and if any further changes are required to ensure we keep our patients safe. In 2017, Theresa May announced the public inquiry a week after Tainted Blood started legal action. A few weeks previously, the former Labour Health Secretary Andy Burnham used his final speech in the Commons to claim that the use of contaminated blood was a criminal cover-up on an industrial scale. He said that if the government did not act, he would pass his evidence to the police. Des Collins says those speaking at the infected blood inquiry hearings feel they owe a debt to people like the Lewis brothers and other victims to keep going until they're sure the extent of the scandal is revealed. It's still happening today in the sense that it is still being covered up and until that cover-up comes to an end, I don't think the campaigners will ever rest, and nor should they. Bev Tumulty was a child when she got to know Professor Arthur Bloom. She can now reassess his legacy through her own professional knowledge. You're a nurse. You work in a hospital with serious medical practitioners who are 
great deal of expertise. Can you see how it's possible that Professor Bloom did what he did? I can see as an eminent scientist who he was at the time, thought, oh, we need to look more into this. But I do think poor decisions were made. The Hippocratic Oath says, first cause the patient no harm. Well, he fell at the first hurdle. Do you think he crossed a line? Yes, I do. I do think he crossed a line. And he made some very poor clinical decisions. The timeline, the history proves that all this did happen and we know the events of that. Colin died as a very young boy. He was the weight of a, I think, an 18-month-old baby when he died, you know, and it, it was painful to watch. His parents have never and will never get over his death. The judge heading the inquiry here in Cardiff is Sir Brian Langstaff. On Friday, he hears from Bev Tumulty and from Hayden's widow, Gaynor Lewis. Yesterday, Sue Sparks told the inquiry about her husband, Les. And this morning, Janet and Colin Smith were here to talk about little Colin. Colin, Janet, you've just given evidence. It was clearly very emotional for you. It was very emotional. Um, Duties. I'd probably go home tonight and just have a really good cry because... Uh, I found it very emotional myself, talking about my son, talking about the support that we've had from people, but I'm glad it's over. I didn't look at the crowds because if I seen them crying, I know it set me off as well, and I'm a bloke, I don't want to cry. You talked today about Professor Bloom and yeah. his involvement. Yeah. Do you think what he did is being sufficiently examined? No, not at all. You know, the, the thing is... He can't answer now, can he? Because he died. And um, I find that a a little bit sad because I'd love to have seen him worm his way out of what he'd done. Not just to Colin, but to a lot of him feel out down there. And there were tears, though. Oh, there was. I could hear them, and that's why I didn't look up either. (laughs) I think... Pick a spot and look at it, and don't watch the distress you're actually causing by giving your story, because they're all so similar. Everybody has got the same story. Um, And do you think little Colin's voice has finally been heard? Yes. Oh, my God, yeah. Very much so. Yeah. You'd be shouting from a cloud up there, you've done it, Mum and Dad, you've done it. And I think he'd be very proud of that. Yeah, he's got his sidekicks with him, he's got Gareth and Hayden with him, so, yeah, I dread to think what they're actually doing. But hopefully they're enjoying themselves and looking down at us with a bit of pride. That edition of Ion Wales was presented by Stephen Fairclough. It was the last in the current series and the programme will return in the autumn. If you have a story you think the programme should tackle, you can contact them by emailing ionwales at bbc.co.uk or by calling 02920 322 406.